Okay, so I'm told that I have to start. So let's begin. Uh, this lecture is very, very, very introductory compared to everything you have uh, uh, learned in these days. And I actually uh, a bit uh, uh, nervous because uh, I see that the audience has a very high standard and I hope uh, uh, this will not be too boring for people who already know MPI, for example. Um, uh, I am uh, in charge of the course that Chineka has every year about MPI and OpenMP. And uh, uh, usually for our courses, uh, there are, we have a limit of 25, 30 students. We get a lot of uh, requests for uh, courses like Python, like GPU, like uh, now deep learning is a great trend. And uh, I noticed it, I started to think that something is going uh, off the way with MPI since my last course had only 14 uh, people. So I'm starting to think that maybe also today we are learning that uh, GPU is, try is starting to do all the work. So really, I started to think that uh, probably I'm, like, I'm becoming like a history teacher, the teacher of the good old times. In any case, uh, well, if you already know MPI, either you are going to remember the basics or you are going to do something else. You know, don't worry about that. I'm not uh, judging anyone. For people who still have, uh, want to learn, and uh, cover up the basic and the history of high performance computing. Here are some uh, standard tips about MPI 101. Starting with me not being able to move on the slide. So, basic introduction. Basic concepts and the very first uh, MPI program, which is the, uh, the standard Hello World written with this language, with this. Uh, Paradigm. And then, uh, at least at this part of the presentation, we will cover the most standard and used way to uh, make CPU communicate data, which is the point to point communication, when a particular processor wants to communicate with another particular process from A to B. If we will have time, I will show you something about the collective communicators, since they were teased a lot of time during the rest of the school. But uh, for now, we start with the basics. So we start with point to point, send and receive. And the biggest problem that usually comes with it, which is when we face a situation of a data. What is MPI? MPI stands for Message Passing Interface. It was born around the 80s, 90s, and something when the parallel computing started to get, uh, uh, to get interested and used also away from making all those processors that are working together, communicate between each other, share data, synchronize, and do everything they can together. It is different from OpenMP. OpenMP, I remember, I remind you that was, has been the topic of uh, Tuesday afternoon. It is another parallel paradigm program that uh, involves uh, CPUs, at least for these cases. OpenMP has uh, this model where the memory is only one. It is called the shared memory model one single block of memory where all the processes, all the CPUs are looking into. And when it's time, the execution is serial. When it's time, there is this fork and join model where the, the threads start to uh, expand and uh, take care of, uh, for example, the iteration of a for loop, something like that. They share the work. And uh, after the region is closed, we return to the serial execution until a new region is. This is OpenMP. MPI does something completely different. The idea of MPI is that any uh, CPU that in this language we call task or process, any task is performing uh, the code from the beginning to the end independently in a separate batch of memory. So we call it distributed memory paradigm. Any processor, any task sees only its own memory. It doesn't know what they are, they are doing, the other tasks are doing. The only way for them to know something, a little something about the others is to communicate, share messages. I have this data, I want to send you, you this other data so that you are aware and you can work on them. So this is a completely different part. The idea that the memory is not shared anymore, but it's distributed. Any task has their own branch of memory. There are advantages. Communication hardware and software are important. Of course, uh, 
very highly optimized, also at hardware level, mostly, or implementation level. Mostly, the architecture is, all, is designed so that they can get the most advantage from MPI implemented locally. The compilers, the, the vendors of various MPI compilers are trying to optimize as much as possible, so this is still uh, something that is valid for a lot of reasons. It is portable in the sense that uh, uh, performance is not that portable, it depends from where you launch it, or from what you use to compile, etc. But uh, the standards are decided. Whatever is, uh, is being doing for your command at a very low level, you know that the standard is that, and uh, your command is written that in that way, and it will do exactly what you've asked it to. It is scalable in the sense that it is made for scalability. So uh, if you're using it well, it will uh, improve with. Uh, with uh, the number of tasks that you are uh, putting in and as a log history. So one of the many reasons you want to learn MPI may be simply because uh, I am working on this project that uses MPI and I can't read that code that I need to read that code. This is one of the main reasons why people still apply to this kind of schools. Even it may be old fashioned for some things, it is still true that it is relevant. There's a lot of history behind it. There's a lot of uh, literature and documentation, so it is still important to know what is going on. Even if I want maybe to port those that application from GPU, I need to start in point in any case. As some drawbacks, it is very explicit, doesn't leave anything to imagination. It is not abstract at all. I have to write exactly what message I want to send, with how many elements, with what kind of data type, to what kind of processor. I need full control on everything and the more detailed your code has to be, the higher is the risk that you're going to be to make some error. It is error prone. It needs uh, a serious rethinking. If you have a serial program and you want to parallelize it, you have to think differently. You have to think parallel. You have to remember that uh, it is not only one CPU performing the job, but everyone is performing the job at the same time and everyone is independent from one another. This makes you have to rethink usually a lot of things when you're writing your code. It is very explicit. As I was saying, you have full control, the user has full control of everything. And so uh, the parallelism, irrelevance is up to you. It's mostly up to you. And uh, not necessarily granted just because you are using MPI. But the golden rule is to use MPI as less as possible. Since uh, uh, communication has a cost, it is a thing that we have alerted, that you already know, communication has a huge cost. Uh, the less they, they need to communicate, the better it is. Just that little communication that is enough to split the work among all the various tasks and uh, gather the data if necessary. Excessive communication degrades program performance because at that point, we saw also the scalability curve some days ago. At a certain point, uh, the fact that there are too many processors involved becomes a problem because we spend more time in communicating yeah. than in having actual advantages by splitting the work. So MPI was born in 1994. At the beginning, there are many implementations. We are going through MPI 5. I don't know if that's already there yet. In any case, here we will cover the very basics. So uh, only stuff that you Uh, that was released back at the beginning in MPI 1, the very first standard. Uh, there are a lot of uh, improvements in the first subsequent uh, features. If you get the, the basic idea here, you may be uh, uh, stimulated to search, look for yourself, once you understand more or less how, how does it work, you may be stimulated to search for yourself if, what are the new things that the very standard introduces. It is a thought for, there is a slide that explains better this concept for uh, low level procedural languages, because they are those that are closer to the, uh, to the language spoken by, by the computer themselves. And so they are more able to uh, stand out in terms of performance. So there are, it is created for Fortran and C, or we can also migrate it to C. Uh, it, uh, can be at a, 
it is implementation dependent. That's what uh, I wanted to say. Those that you see listed here are some example of uh, uh, compiler suite that are able to uh, compile your job, your um, uh, code, so that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, MPI aware, parallelization aware. And uh, a lot of implementations are doing uh, are done at that level, meaning that compiler with a different uh, uh, compiler suite may have different, different results in your performance. And also the architecture plays a role. There are some uh, clusters that are tweaked so that a particular communication will work better than others. And uh, it, a lot depends from, there is a lot of error and error in a sense. You may have to search for your preferred uh, implementation in many different ways. What you are, what is guaranteed is the standard. The fact that you write an MPI function or routine, it is written like this and like this, and you're sure that wherever you run it, uh, you don't have to change that part of code anymore, unless you're looking for a better optimization. Of course. And place is, is, is implemented as libraries, header files. So there are, it is basically, it is not a programming language, it is a pro programming paradigm. So there are APIs, there are interfaces, there are libraries that you can add to your existing serial code to let it be, let it know that there is also MPI involved. For example, here, if you load inside our clusters in Cineca, the module OpenMPI, it uh, gives you the possibility to uh, have a suite of compilers that uh, run, uh, that can compile parallel jobs. One of them is MPI F90, which is for Fortran. If you just try to type MPI F90 with the option show, you see what is actually behind this, uh, uh, this alias. And there is the standard, not GCC, this is an error, of course. You can imagine that here there is a GFortran uh, with the headers from the module and a lot, a lot of information that basically the libraries that basically are saying uh, uh, use this uh, to compile with MPI, with uh, the minus L MPI at the end. Let's say you have, we have skipped a lot of steps that we are covering uh, next. And we have already our first parallel code in MPI. Uh, what do I do? Usually I get my compiler. Here I still imagining a supercomputer like Chineca where everything is in modules. Uh, it actually depends from wherever you are running your parallel job. So let's say that you have to load the model with the parallel compilers and then uh, in the example of Fortran, the compiler MPI F90, where you give them the executable, the name that you want. Or for C, you have MPI CC. In this example, you, you combine many, uh, many C source codes to create a, a unique uh, parallel program. And then you run your job. Inside the job script, inside the batch job that we have learned to use in Leonardo, for example, our execution line will be my executable, of course, but it will also be uh, preceded by something like MPI run or S run. S run is a Slurm tool that basically does the same thing that MPI do. Uh, the idea is uh, to make that uh, execution MPI aware. Let the processes know that uh, at a certain point there may be communication involved. And uh, you can uh, Stick to the default, which is the number of tasks that you have requested in your job allocation, or you can be specific. I want to run with four tasks. And there are tons of other options of organization that I won't cover, but this is the basic idea. When we will have our parallel uh, application, we will compile it with that, with these commands, and run with those other commands. That's the idea. That's the idea. There are some other things that are going to be interesting. If you're a C++ user, these are the names. You have the slide because I, I asked to make them available for you so you can get all the various mini names also from there. Please don't use MPI inside a login node of a cluster, of any cluster. Or think of Chineca cluster, but I think that for other computer center it is the same. Login is an environment for all the users to share. So perform basic stuff. You can compile, for example, you can move a, a file from a folder to another, but don't start executing parallel execution because that may slow down the login node for all the other users, and that may be a problem. So, a parallel uh, 
running is thought to be moved inside the computer. So we will write a job and we will see that when we wanted to run our parallel application. As I was saying, MPI was thought with Fortran or C in mind. Exercises will be also mostly on for those languages. It is possible to program with C++. There are also, I think, uh, new ideas about that. But as far as the standard goes, the MPI standard, uh, at a certain point, it was dropped because it was, uh, there were no real advantages over C. And uh, uh, there was no reason to continue it further. So you can still uh, uh, use MPI on C++, but uh, uh, consider it as part of a C extension. Let's say that uh, you use the same MPI commands you were using if you were uh, uh, running them in C. And then, since the Python is everywhere, there is also uh, an interface called MPI for Py. It comes with uh, it's a standard Python package. It has a different way of uh, organizing the standard, but uh, it can also be used if you want to try uh, running MPI with Py. That don't guarantee good performances, but the possibility is there. And we are also during the slide, we'll provide mostly examples for Fortran and C, but I know there are some people that may be more used with Python, so there will be examples for them and they can try to do exercises as well. But starting by the, with the basic languages, uh, these are the main, now we started to get technical. We go to writing code and start about talking about the syntax, for example, this kind of stuff. Uh, the main differences between uh, uh, writing an MPI code in C and an MPI code in Fortran. Uh, the headers. C, of course, needs an MPI header. So your, your uh, MPI code always starts with include mpi.h. In Fortran, there is a module. Use MPI F90 right here. Or I think that you just need to use MPI as far as I remember. And uh, there are also other ways that are not recommended because we, they were allowed to uh, drop it while subsequent start. So use MPI is fine. All MPI commands in C are functions. And all MPI commands return an error code. Error code is equal to zero if the communication of the MPI command went fine, or another number if there was a problem and the number the, the class what kind of problem it is. In C, uh, the error code is uh, the return value of the MPI function. So you can, for example, initialize an integer and say that the integer takes the value of the result of the MPI command. But this is optional. You can also just write MPI command and uh, stop caring about the error. You don't have such luxury in Fortran because uh, error codes are returned the next arguments. So you always have to declare an integer for the error, and remember to always have it as the final parameter of your MPI thing. We will see many examples about this. Arrays are normally provided as pointers to void in case of C, are used by reference in case of Fortran, so writing is a little easier. Fortran is not case sensitive, so MPI also is not case sensitive. But uh, C is case sensitive, and therefore there is a specific syntax also for caseness in the case of C. And we will see it very soon. Also, for people interested in MPI for Pi, you require an import, import MPI from MPI for Pi. Mm -hmm. All MPI commas are methods related to objects, mostly, mostly communicators. We will get to the notion of communicator in a moment. In any case, every command are Python methods. Error code are uh, attributes of the communicators and arrays are used by reference. So for example, let's say here, you have uh, an MPI send written in uh, MPI for Pi. It is actually a method of the communicator. And uh, all the data and all the par input parameters are here. There are two uh, important distinctions. There are two kinds, two ways to write uh, Python method for MPI. And here, uh, the case sensitiveness is important. If you write a com send with everything, a case, uh, everything lowercase, you are basically working with objects. And so with something that is more familiar to the standard Python user, 
but it is not really good for HPC users because they want to have full control of whatever happens to their day. If you write a send with the uppercase in the S like this, and then you have to specify uh, you have to specify buffer-like objects with that syntax for commas that we see later their meaning, uh, then uh, you have uh, a better control because uh, uh, the data buffers are not uh, abstract anymore, but you have, uh, you it, it, it say that it's more similar to what you do in C and 4. So for simplicity, like our pattern example will be all over case, but remember that uh, it is for HPC users, it is better to try to understand at least uh, how to do that in the other case. Where do I start? As I was saying at the beginning, the idea is that any task works by on its own and doesn't care about uh, whatever is happening behind that, between all the other tasks. They only care while there is communication involved. Communication can be point to point, task A communicates specifically with task B, or can be collective. Any task has communicated with any other task. And this is written, of course, at a certain point of our code. So many MPI tasks are launched at the start of program execution, Nobody sees the other and just perform this very same code independently as if it were serial. They have their own local memory because the memory is distributed and they don't see, they don't know uh, what is initialized in the other tasks. And uh, when it is time, uh, there are communication or synchron also synchronization, like uh, uh, barriers. I want uh, all the uh, tasks to be at that point before I continue. We will try to write something like that. There are many kinds of calls. Calls used to initialize, manage, and terminate communication. Calls for the communication between two specific processors, which is the point-to-point. -point. Calls for communication among group of processors, which is the collective communication. And calls to create a better environment for MPI. We don't cover it here, but you can set up your own data type so you can send packs of data in a single instruction. Or we can create topologies. For example, we can organize our processor in a Cartesian grid. So it has a better, uh, it's a better simulation of what we have in mind. Cartesian is an example, there may be many others. My very first MPI program. It's written here. In C and in Porta. Just to broad the things that I've already said, I told you that I have to start with the header. So include MPI H for C, use MPI for Fortran. I told you something about the error integer that you can use it like this in C. You declare an integer at the beginning and then MPI init, which is an MPI call, as that as the return value. And you can print it if you want. Or uh, if you are working for Fortran, it is always has to be an extra parameter and can't be optional. The final parameter of your code. And then there are other things that we're getting to in a minute. First, uh, ah, okay, the syntax. As I was saying, there is a specific syntax for, uh, especially for C, because Fortran is case insensitive, so you don't care. The syntax for all MPI calls in any case is MPI underscore the name of the code and the actual eventual parameters. For, for Fortran, you can write it all lowercase or uppercase, mix the cases, it doesn't matter. For C, there is a specific syntax. MPI, all uppercase, underscore. First letter, lowercase, uppercase, and the rest, lowercase. The arrow value is an integer, and uh, yes, and these are all things that I've already said, so I move on. And get giving you the very first MPI function, which is as simple as it gets, MPI init. MPI init is like opening a parallel region of an MP. It is not really the same thing, but let's say that the idea is that from that point on, the processors are aware that the, there may be communication involved with the other processors. Before that, uh, the code is serial, but in the sense, in the distributed sense, each code will uh, write their own serial part. There you go. Yeah, they will execute their own serial part. And uh, uh, when you have MPI in it, by that point, they also know that there are others around it and may have to communicate. 
So with Fortran, it's easier because you just have to remember the error integer at the end. On C, you have to specify the argc and argv that you usually uh, specify when uh, initializing the main. So in case of MPI application, it is important to uh, initialize the main in a full way. So ju ju not just uh, void main and open and close the brackets, but you have to specify argc and argv because for, uh, um, let's say for legacy reasons, uh, there are, uh, MPI need to expect them. So even if you don't really use the RCN and Argavu, your main has to use them because MPI need to expect them. Remember this detail also. And uh, just as you have begun your MPI session, you have also to close it with MPI finalize. Finalize, finalize is easy, no parameters at all, except for the arrow integer import. From that point on, the communication isn't there anymore and everyone can conclude the serial part independently. So every code has to start with MPI init and have to conclude, has to conclude with MPI final app. And then there are a lot of different things in between. When you initialize everything with MPI init, you are actually creating your first communicator. Communicator is basically a set of processes, a set of tasks that are able to communicate with each other. There are ways to create personalized communicators, like I decided to create a communicator that takes only these four, but we are not covering that. You just have to remember that at the very beginning, the MPI init creates your very first communicator that simply is the communicator that involves every any task that I have using for the job. So the communicator of all, and it has a name, and the name is MPI convert. So in a lot of uh, uh, routines and functions, you will see that you have to specify the communicator. And uh, for today, we are always specifying MPI convert. So this is not, this is a more difficult, not that difficult, but this is the very first uh, uh, important uh, uh, code that we are writing, both in C and in Fortran. Let's analyze that. They are specular. I mostly a C user, so I am more used to uh, check with you the C uh, example, but Fortran is basically specular, so you can basically follow and do the same thing. So what happens here? We include the header. We create a main, and in the main, we specify the arc C and the arc group because uh, MPI needs. We create, we declare an integer for an error and two integers, one for the number of processor and one more for my specific rank. MPI init to initialize with RC and RV, and we decided that we want to, to store in the R variable the eventual error that has been returned. For example, we can say if R equal to zero, then communication is successful, or we can just skip that control. There are two functions that we have, haven't explored yet that are telling the system how many processors are there and what is my specific ID of my specific process. More on the, about that in a minute. And then I'm printing. I print that I am that particular rank of that particular number of processors. And I finalize at the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will see that better. The, yeah, the idea is written a little bit here. The rank varies from zero to n minus one, with n being the number of processors. Imagine that you have four tasks, okay? They, they each have an ID. So there is task zero, task one, task two, and task three. Cool. The function communicates and stores in the variable my rank your actual ID. So from that point on, you know that you are task number two, but we will see that in another slide, an ID. And ID. if I am task two, then I perform that application. That is really an ID. Uh, remember, especially Fortran users, that the ranks uh, range from zero to n minus one. So there is a rank zero, and oh, and finally a rank n minus one. Even if you are thinking in Fortran when everything starts from one to one, this is not true for MPI ranks. And uh, just a little uh, blows here. That's because we have to remember the syntax. Use MPI, implicit norm, which is a Fortran thing. Uh, those integers, there is the parameter of uh, error that is always at the end of any function for Fortran. 
uh, a writing of uh, my pro and proxy and my rank that have been initialized inside the NPI course and the final other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's just a typo, yeah. They have to, you have to have it. <laughs> no, no, you're right. It is better to clarify that uh, there is not uh, weird stuff going on. They should be have semicolons and be interesting. Now, to understand even better these concepts, let's say that you have uh, submitted a job with eight tasks, with eight CPUs. Our proc size is eight. So let's see if I have it here. Read MPI com size will uh, uh, communicate for me, will uh, tell us that there are eight processors involved inside the, that specific communicator, actually. But that communicator is, in our example, MPI com word, which means all the tasks involved. And it will store the result in that. Um, in that uh, integer that we have declared, ready to use, that uh, we call side here. And so that's important. So from this point on, size is equal to eight in our previous example. Then we know that each side is a task as a rank, an ID, a way to recognize it. So you can play with the code and say, only if I am a particular task, then I perform a particular action. MPI com rank is <clears throat> the uh, function or the routine that takes care of that aspect. So for that specific communicator, which once again is the communicator of everyone, uh, I, I see since I am, uh, I am executing my code independently from the others, even if there is communication involved, uh, I get MPI rank. I at that point one, I know that my rank is, for example, two, and I store that number two inside of that integral rank. So from this point on, I can use this number to do some specific, uh, specific variation of my code. So the rank is, uh, is defined uh, at the beginning with MPI in it. At that point, uh, there is a comic, uh, they create the MPI convert, and at that point, they need to find a rank for each one. But if I want to use that, I have to be, uh, I need to have the rank stored somewhere, and that somewhere is the uh, integer that I use as a return value for MPI com rank. So at the end, rank will have a different value for every process, and I can have some fun with that idea. This is the same example from before. Now I can imagine that if I am rank zero, at this point I will get zero as my rank, and if I print my rank here, here I will print zero. I don't see the value of my rank of the other processes because each should have their own local memory. And so each they have their own copy of my rank, which corresponds to a different number. So I will print this line over here. I am zero of four blocks. Note also that the order is not respected because it basically, uh, it's also because each task is completely independent from the others. So I see only myself, and I may be the first to get to the output buffer and be the first that goes to write stuff. If the first that I reach at that point is rank one, one will be the first to be printed. There are ways to reorder these, but they usually uh, get heavy on computation, so it is not strictly necessary. It is not really important that, uh, that uh, our things are written in order, then usually we just let it go and uh, just get ensured that everything is uh, computed. For Python users, let's see, a, let's see a quick example of the things I have just said. I have a Python script, so you can, uh, for example, use uh, bnav python and then just uh, slash it. Or you can use a Python name if executable if you prefer. From MPI, import MPI, as I was saying at the beginning, you have your particular input, import, and uh, you have uh, a communicator, which is MPI.com world in your case, and the communicator is uh, the class, if you want, that uh, can get use the different methods. So for you, you will have this get side and get rank that will store inside your side and your rank integers the side and the rank of your job, of your uh, 
task. You can also have the, do different things like get processor name. In any case, what is important for you is that everything is handled by the communicator. Of course, we are only working with the default communicator also in Python, so MPI on Word. And then you can write whatever you have uh, efficiently get. Also note that uh, MPI scripts don't need it and need to finalize. In their case, it is automatic. And so you don't have to care about the data. Okay. Basically, technically, you can do everything MPI has to offer with six commands. It is not recommended because uh, uh, you've read them too much, your code will become unreadable and also inefficient. But technically, everything can be done with init, finalize, com side, com rank, send, and receive. Point to point. So we are uh, just uh, needing the last two. And we have to discuss about point-to-point -point communication. Point-to-point -point communication is the idea that uh, uh, we can perform basic communication from one specific task to another. They both have to be inside the same communicator. In our case, it will be easy because it is MPI com word. It is conceptually simple. Source process A sends a message to destination process B. B has to be ready to receive the message from it. How to identify source and destination using ranks. In this example, rank zero wants to send something to rank six. And rank six has to be ready to receive something from rank two. A quick example for C and for Fortran. For now, you don't understand, unless you already know MPI and you are, don't know why you're listening to me. In any case, uh, technically, you don't understand it yet what is written here, but you can imagine that. Uh, here we see the first practical use of the MPI com rank. I launch MPI com rank at the beginning to get my own rank, my own ID, and then I use it. If I am zero, I perform a particular send, and I will send the data to the processor one, to the task one. If I am one, my job is to receive. I will receive that particular data from zero. Both in C and in Fortran, once again, remember that C has a particular case sensitiveness in their uh, uh, comments. So MPI or uppercase, first letter uppercase and the rest lowercase. And remember that Fortran doesn't care. Actually, we have a send completely uppercase and I receive completely different. But uh, they both need to have an error integral that may be the same. You can recycle it anytime you want. You just have to put it at the end of your routine. What happens at this point is that we call them node here, but it is luckily more, more a task, let's say. Uh, task A sends some data called Y through the buffer. A message is sent and is received by task B. And this is the gist of it. How do we do that? We have solved those commands. We have solved that there are many uh, parameters that are quite difficult to understand. This is the, um, the review of all the parameters. It is like sending an envelope. An envelope has a body, which is a message contained in it, and the actual information from, from like the address, how to, to send the mail and this kind of stuff. So the body has to contain a buffer, which is basically is the starting point from which I will start to send the data in a contiguous way. I have to imagine that I was sending contiguous bytes in my memory. So a starting point, which is the buffer, a number of elements I'm sending, and the data type, which is the same for all those elements, unless I delve into the world of derived data types, but it is not the case. For today, you always have to send, you only think you want to send packets of uh, uh, elements of the same type, stored contiguously, for example, elements of a contiguous array. This is the body. The envelope uh, requires either a source or a destination. If I'm sending, I want to know where to send. If I'm receiving, I want to know where uh, who will receive me, from who I am receiving. The communicator, because the rank differs depending on the communicator, but in our case here, we will always put MPI convert. And the tag. Tag is an identification of the actual communication. It is important that a particular send 
as a tag that matches that particular scene. I think there is something more about that later. I don't remember the order of the slide. Here, okay, let's go here, then I will turn back. This is what I was trying to say. For a communication to, to succeed, the sender must specify a valid destination rank. The receiver must specify a valid source rank. The communicator one must be the same, and they can work in other examples. The tags have to match, and the buffer must be larger because there is the risk that uh, I am sending uh, a certain amount of data, but uh, uh, the receiver is ready to receive them in a shorter buffer, and that may be a problem. So check very carefully all the arguments of the comment. The comment may also succeed, but be the wrong data. I may send more than I was uh, uh, trying to send, or I may receive less. And then, so that may be a problem. That's it on here. I was talking about data types. That can be the basic or derived, only basic types today, which are defined in the standard, so we can't go wrong. MPI data types are standard data types with an addition of a handler, so they are a little heavier, and so they have a different, a slightly different syntax. So we don't write integer or int, but we write something like MPI int. And uh, we have tables for that. This is the Fortran table. MPI character is what we usually call character in Fortran. MPI integer is what we usually call int, and so on. And for C, there are also MPI byte, MPI packet, if you want to send a particular amount of bytes without caring about the data type that is being in, but it is not recommended. At least it, it, it is quite dangerous, let's say. The same uh, table for C. They are all standard. I, you just imagine your standard. Uh, data type and that MPI underscore for it. And remember, since C is case sensitive, that has to be written all uppercase. Yeah. You can use a console struct, you define it as a derived data type, which is called MPS. But you say, for example, this contains four integers and two floats. And then you send that packet. And yeah, that is a, a topic for an answer question. This is the most uh, uh, tricky uh, and the complicated uh, part to digest. If we get that, uh, you you are ready to go in the world of MPI. The understanding what uh, really means uh, having a message complete. The completion of a message is a, is a concept uh, which. Uh, uh, is used to tell the system from what at what point I can conclude my MPI operation. If uh, I think that my message is completed, I can move to the next instruction of my code, let's say. MPI send, when the send is completed, I can move on. The problem is that completion may not be, will not have the same meaning that you are imagining. The, the correct definition of completion is uh, uh, the moment where my data can be reused. And let's say that uh, in the case of a receiver, it is easier because uh, I can reuse that buffer I have located for receiving data when I have the data that I have been sent to me. In the case of send, this is a little trickier because uh, uh, you are not actually sure that uh, your data has been directly sent inside the uh, buffer, the receiving buffer. If your data is small enough, usually it is stored inside the system buffer, and then the system buffer takes care of putting the data inside the receiver. But from, but from that point on, the sender doesn't care anymore, usually. The sender just has completed that part. The data can be used again, and you can go on with the, with the communication. So, uh, you may want that. You may want a better control of your data. There are variations like MPI, descend, ascend, et cetera, that decide exactly what is your definition of completion. The standard send has that kind of definition of completion. I went to the system buffer, and from that point on, I consider my send communication completed and move on. But uh, if my data, for example, is very big, and the system buffer can host me, because it's usually very small, 
Uh, then I will have to wait for the receive in the other part of the code to arrive. And until I get to that receive, I am uh, stuck at waiting for that. So it may be not efficient. I may be wasting precious compute time just because the send and the receive are not synchronized. So whether you prefer uh, safe reusability or performance over communication, you may decide to, to set up your communication blocking or non-blocking. Blocking means uh, I don't go on until the communication is completed in the sense that I have just tried to describe. Non-blocking means I just uh, tell you that at a certain point in time, I will need a particular send or a particular receive. Meanwhile, go on with your computation. I will put a synchronizer at a certain point to be sure that the data has been successfully uh, communicated. So, there is, so what we have seen so far is actually an example of blocking communication. The standard send and receive are blocking. A blocking send can be synchronous, but can also be not, because as I was saying before, it depends from the system buffer, depends from the position of the corresponding receive. And uh, so it is not uh, guaranteed because this is another scheme of whatever I, I was trying to say. Let's say that if I start from here and I'm getting there, I can consider my send to be completed, but receive is not. So another thing that can happen is that this part of code goes on, but the other uh, task, which is uh, waiting for receive, may not uh, go on yet because there is all still this part that has to be completed. It's really up to the user, the implementer, to decide what kind of communication they prefer. And also, a lot of these details are very low level and implementation dependent. In some systems, there may be buffer that can host more data, or the implementation goes to other ways that we don't know because we trust the standard, the fact that that particular uh, routine or function will uh, describe that particular data movement. We trust the standard and we trust the implementation. So the classic standard blocking send and receive has this syntax. Now we understand it better. MPI send starts with a buffer. Uh, for example, an array, usually the starting point from where I begin to uh, send my, or receive my data, send in my case, working MPI. So I want to send that buffer. Uh, of that particular number of elements of that particular de MPI data type. And then the envelope. I'm working with uh, send, so I need a destination. I need a tag, which is an integral number that identifies the message. I need a communicator, which usually is MPI convert in our case. And uh, if I am fortunate, I need an error. In the case of the receive, receiving buffer, number of elements, data type, source from which I am receiving the info, tag that has to match to the corresponding send, communicator, and also the status. That is something that I define and I leave there and may be recovered afterwards to get information about my communication. For example, the original rank, the tag that was there, and all the kind of information. Or I can use a wildcast. I can just use MPI any tag or MPI any source if I don't care about that. Remember, in any case, when you are working with the receiver to uh, specify also uh, an object called the status that has to be sent here and that is storing information about the communication itself. And in case of fault, I'm going to take a So this is blocking communication. I start with an MPI send. Task zero asks for an MPI send. It notifies the Task one, which is meanwhile performing calculation. It will wait until the data is safely sent, whatever it is to tackle destination at that moment. It knows that it can reuse data from that point on, and so it can continue. Meanwhile, the receiver has finally arrived to the MPI receive, uh, waits for the availability of the data, receive it, and then it can continue as well. So there may, be not be a, there may not be a complete synchronization, and we have to be aware of that. An example with an important. I will I try to do some example in C, some other important, so everyone can listen to me. I call MPI init, I call com size and com rank, I get the results in my size and my rank. Remember the error. 
So if I am zero, I want to initialize an array of two elements. Initialize them at three or five point zero. And then I call MPSN. I send my array A of two elements of type MPI real to uh, task one. I set a tag of 10. I remember that my communicator is a tech on word and I put the error because I am a four. After this point, the communication is completed, at least as far as send is concerned. I want to move over this instruction until send doesn't feel like the communication is completed in their own sense. And at that point, I can start using A again to do some other stuff. I don't risk that I modify A and then get sent afterwards with a different data. If I am one, I am the receiver. So I receive in my buffer B of two elements of type MPI real from zero, tag that has to match, MPI convert is my communicator, the status, which is in case it is not written here, maybe we we'll return to that later. How do I define the status? And the error. At that point, I can write. Here I write A, probably if I put there an A, it is better. In any case, let's say that the data can be used. It can be safely used because the receiver doesn't move from here until it has received. So blocking gives you more safety about what is going on with your data. Also remember a thing, it is important when you are starting to think about efficiency and you have to choose uh, if uh, um, writing your highly performant code in C or Fortran, remember that C thinks in rows and Fortran thinks in columns. It means that uh, if your array starts there, you say that you have to communicate a, a row or a column of a matrix. Your array starts there and you send five contiguous elements. If you are look, doing that in C, you will send the same elements of a row. If you are working with Fortran, you will send five elements of a call. This can be, become really important if you are starting to communicate a lot of uh, uh, matrices, arrays, this kind of stuff, because uh, it may very affect your, uh, the state of your implementation. If you're thinking of rows, but using Fortran, the things in columns or vice versa. So this is something that a uh, programmer at a certain point uh, have to be uh, at least quite aware of. No blocking communication. Uh, the level of syntax is just adding an I to the non-blocking communication. Not really, there is much more, but the idea is that uh, I send uh, the, the input of uh, uh, the request of an MPI non-blocking communication it can be I send or I receive. And so I post a data, a data request. It doesn't mean that uh, I want to go on until my receive is complete. I keep going on calculation, 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 calculation. At a certain point, I want to be sure that the data I have received has to be used, can be used. And so I put an MPI wait, which is a function or a routine for a synchronization, getting sure that at that point the data, the communication is completed. From here, do that. If you are sure that the data you have asked is not uh, is not to be used in between, you can uh, safely continue work. Your work. So you don't have to wait for the receivable complete before uh, continue moving on with your computation. And at that point, you have new data and you can continue with that new data, being sure that it is the data that you want. This is the idea of non-blocking operation. They send a request of communication when the, the task will be aligned, the, the, the communication will have a chance to succeed, and you wait, you put a wait when you want to be sure that the data that you asked for is finally at their, at their destination. So they are primarily used to overlap communication with uh, computation. And it is very important with for performance reasons, of course, because it is a choice. 
Not probably. Okay, probably I wanted to use boot set send before the previous one. Let's return a previous moment to blocking communication. For Python users, this is the example. I import MPI, MPI Word, which is the name of my communicator. So I can just use com as a, an alias for easier things. I get rank here. And here is what happens. Send is a method to the communicator. This is the lowercase send, so there are a lot of things that are skipped. This is just a, an object. My buffer is A, my destination is 1, and my tag is 10. The rest is all implicit in Python. If I am 0. If I am rank, I receive from 0 with the same tag and with a particular status. Note that the buffer, the receiving buffer, is uh, uh, the return uh, value of the method. So I, say, I use uh, receive as a, as a method of the communicator, and uh, whatever I get to return is whatever I was uh, being uh, receiving from uh, the task view. The other stuff is implicit, and the status is actually optional. In Python, is uh, more versatile of that point of view. Returning, sorry for the interruption. Returning to non blocking send receive. The syntax I send or I receive. The rest is basically the same buffer, count, data type, destination, tag, communicator, request. An object of type MPI request, which is an handler to, to handle the, the non blocking communication. When we will define the weight, the weight will ask for that request and be sure that. The communication with that request will be completed. That's its, uh, its job. Note also that in MPI I receive, the status is missing. What is it? We will see it now. Because I actually care about the status of my communication when the communication is completed. And the point where the non blocking communication is completed is when I get to the wait. Wait function takes the request. That I have uh, set up in the actual send and the actual receive and returns the status of the communication. There is also the possibility to uh, perform several uh, non blocking communication and then stack them together and use a wait all to uh, synchronize all of them with an array of requests and array of services. It is also a possibility. For an example, in C this time, it, also, it is also useful for understanding a couple of things that I have listed a little. I have this uh, function with two doubles, A and B, two elements each. MPI init, com size and com rank. Here I have to write n procs and my rank to be coherent with what's there. So sorry about that. Uh, I also set up uh, uh, this uh, particular uh, object called MPI request and MPI state. This is how I declare the fact that I'm going to use requests and statuses. They are uh, elements of type MPI request and MPI status, respectively. This is true for C. For Fortran, everything is an integer, so it is a little different. Everything is an integer, so you will define additional integers like 0 and like 1. The only difference is status, which is not an integer, but it is an object, uh, an array of integers of side MPI status side, which is defined by the star. We will see that with examples. For now, we are in C, so rec 0, rec 1, and status. If I am 0, I initialize the array A with an additional typo here. And I, I, I receive. I receive from the task 1. It might be two elements of type double from task one, communication tag, then MPI convert, and I put a request, rec zero, to be, be sure that uh, at a certain point, uh, thanks to that request, my communication will be called. Then I, I ask for MPI send. Please note that uh, uh, blocking and non-blocking can be overlapped. I don't need to match uh, non-blocking with another non-blocking or a blocking with another. I can non-block the send and block the receive or vice versa like we're doing in this case. I send A, two elements, double, rank one, 
tag 10. I use the same tag for everything because I don't care about text. MPI convert. Finally, MPI wait. At this point, I want that my uh, I receive as completed. And here I will also receive a status that I put here, that I will store here. This is if I am rank zero. If I am rank one, my A will be initialized with 3.0 and 5.0. I receive, which is the same thing with a rank one at the end, just to uh, uh, separate them. An MPI send that is in standard, and then MPI wait for that particular rank one. At the end, I can print the ending results. Each task will print a different uh, output. Rank zero will write rank zero as received the, the three and the five from rank one, while rank one will write I am rank one, I have received two and four from that uh, that I received from zero. Penalize and return. So uh, why these have save us time? Because if the receive has to be completed here and the receive has to be completed there, if they were blocking, they were the first instruction of each uh, case, we would get stuck there. A situation called the deadlock that we will, will actually explain better uh, in the following slides. Of course, there are other ways to avoid this situation, like putting two receives at the beginning is actually quite dumb, but uh, it is easy to show you that can still be done using non blocking efficiently. This is the Python example. Python example as uh, rec as the output value of the non-blocking communication. So in this case, I have an I send and an I receive in both, in both, uh, for both ranks. So it is a little different. Rec one is the, for the I send for task zero. Rec two is for the I send of the I receive for the task zero. The rest is like before. I put the weight in the rack one, so I make sure that my I send has been completed. And I put the weight on rack two. And uh, at that point, since here the communication is completed, I will get uh, the data. So B, the buffer array I'm receiving uh, the data to, becomes the uh, return value of the method weight in the case of non blocking community. And for, to the other part, the same example written twice. Why use non blocking non communication? At this point, we have more or less understood the reason behind it is to overlap communication with computation to avoid this kind of uh, problem where I, I am zero, I write for a send, I need to wait uh, if my buffer is uh, not big enough, is not uh, big enough, yes, to contain my data. For example, I may need to wait for the receipt. And uh, at that point, I will have wasted a lot of computation. If I use I send or I receive, I can continue going until I get an MPI weight. And so a lot of time uh, in communication has been, uh, has been uh, saved. The drawback is that you have to be really aware of what you are doing because you are not sure that the communication is completed and that the data that they've used for communication has been safely uh, communicated. It can, it can be read. I have a last uh, four or five slides about the first before going to the exercises. They are just about the deadlock. Deadlock or race condition is, uh, in the example from before, we saw an example, an avoided example uh, of what happens in this kind of circumstance. I have task zero, task one. Zero can proceed only if one has taken action B and then can perform action A. One can continue only if zero has taken action A and then can do action B. What happens here? That they are both stuck because they are waiting for an operation that uh, can't be performed until the other performs the same operation. And uh, uh, the code, the program can not, don't go on. This is a very uh, problematic situation because uh, you don't get an error in compile time or you don't get an error around time and your job closed you get a situation where uh, your uh, application keeps going, waiting forever, forever. You don't know that, and you are consuming uh, CPU hours doing nothing and hoping for nothing because uh, uh, you don't have an abort, but you have uh, just a, continu a continuous and infinite wait. 
and this consumes a lot of your allocated time and it is not worth it. So avoiding deadlock is uh, a must for NPI programmers. Why is this an example? I don't know, I don't remember. But we'll see it together. Uh, also gives me a chance uh, to uh, tell you something about uh, status in Fortran. As I was saying, uh, in Fortran, everything is an integer, even MPI request. The only exception is the status, which is not of type MPI status like in C, but it is an integer with that particular size that is defined by the state. You define it here when you put use MPI, MPI status size. That being said, return to the deadlock. Well, this is actually the example from before in blocking form. I received that data, and then I will send the data to the other uh, task. I receive, uh, if I'm the other task, I receive the first set, then set, both in Fortran and in C. This is obviously a problem because uh, I will keep uh, waiting for receive for data that has never been sent. Being this a blocking situation, my receive won't go on until the send arrives, but the send never arrives because it waits for the other set. And so this is a deadlock. Actually, it is not really true that it is necessarily a deadlock. But we, if you want safe uh, communication, we want to avoid it, and there are ways. Uh, checking the correct alignment, checking the matching text, uh, using non-blocking communication, using a function called send receive, which is the last function I will show you now. Uh, and these all uh, save us. This is the same situation from before with a send receive inverted for one of the tasks. At that point, zero will send, one will receive, and then one will send and zero will receive, and that is the work. Question. What happens here? What happens if uh, uh, send and receive are in the same order for both? Is this a deadlock or not? Remember that all these instructions are blocking. Hmm? Potentially. What uh, determines the potential? Exactly. It depends because, as I was told you, uh, telling you earlier, the completion of the send depends on the reusability of the data, not from the actual data being received by the other process. There is a transition, which is the system buffer. So if the send element data is small enough to be stored in the system buffer while waiting for the receive, then we can go on. This send puts the data in the system buffer and then it waits for the, and then it goes to the receive. Meanwhile, these others are the same and at that point, both are ready to get, to receive what was stored in the system buffer from that. If the data is too big, we got this problem. The send can't allocate the data in the system buffer, has to wait for the receive. The receive never comes, and so this is that. So this is an even trickier situation because it is implementation dependent. Somewhere it can work because the system buffer is good enough. Somewhere else it may not. Your code is not portable, and there is a risk. So always check the send receive alignment or use non blocking communication, or you will send or receive. Send receive is, you, is used uh, mostly for circular communication. Task zero, send data to task one. Task one, send data to task two. Task two, send data to task three. Task three is the last, send the data back to task zero. Periodic circular communication. What it does? It does a send and then receive together. So I send. Uh, First, the send part. The green part is the send part. I send my buffer with my particular account, with my particular data type, to a certain destination with a certain tag, and then the receiving part. I receive my buffer to that particular account, with that particular data type, to that particular source, and that particular tag. The communicator is always the same, and since there is a receive involved, I also have to specify the status. So there are three ranks involved. The calling process, the one that reads the send receive. The source process, the one that is sending me data, and the receive process, the one that I, I send the data to. At that point, I can use it for secular communication purposes, And I don't uh, risk deadlock because everything is performed in the same instruction. 
The last example of this set of slides is uh, from C, and it is a send receive example. So uh, it is also, let's say, a summary of everything we covered so far. I set up our uh, integers from rank, number of processor, and also I imagine a cyclic communicator. So I want to know which is the processor on my left and the processor on my right. I set up two buffers, which, which are integers, one for sending, one for receiving. I set up my status that in case of C is an element of type MPS state. Initialize. Comside the com rank, so I know the number of processors with comside and the number of ranks my specific ID with my rank. And then I want to know my neighbors. I have two ways to do that. Example one, I wanted to know which is the neighbor of my right. I imagine that it is the task immediately after me. So I am true, my right will be free, for example. Easy enough when we are not dealing with uh, limits. But if I am three, I don't want the result four, I want the result zero. So an idea is to use the module. This is the operation that gives you the remainder of a particular division. So my rank plus one module procs. If I am two, two plus one makes three. Three module four makes uh, three because three divided by four is zero with the remainder of three. But if I am three, the last one, three plus one makes four. Four module four makes zero because four divided by four is one with the remainder of three. So this is a way to do that. Another way, if I don't want to, to involve myself in a lot of mathematics, I just write, uh, for the example of my left processor, so the one on my left, the number previous with me, I just put my rank minus, minus one, but in the case I am this uh, limit, and I want that my left processor to be free to recover the cycle, I just write, if I am zero, then I am, my left is actually free, four minus one. That, that's also fine. Having been done that, I want to send my rank. So my buffer underscore s that you don't see. It. Buffer underscore s equal my rank. So this is also something that I have to correct. I send it lightway. If I want to send single elements in C, since uh, uh, basically buffers are pointers. And in case of array, just the name of array is fine because it means the starting element of that array. If I want to send a single element, I have to specify the address from where I take that particular element. So I have to use the syntax, ampersand buffer s. The point in memory from where my buffer s starts, and I have to go on for one MPI integer, for four bytes. Usually. So I send one element of type integer starting from buffer s, which is equal to my rank. I send it to my right. I use a tag one to three, which is good. I receive in my buffer R, defined the same way, one element, type MPI integer, from my left, tag the same. The tag here is always the same because I don't really care about text. The communicator globally is MPI convert, and then a status for the receive. Finalize everything from to zero. So, zero will have received three, one will have received zero. Here I forgot to put a print that show you that uh, my I have received my the rank from my left, and I have gave my rank to the process to my right. And this is how send receive works. Finally, for this theoretical part, point to point is the most basic communication using two or three proxies. In the case of send receive, important to recognize the difference between a blocking and non-blocking. The advantages when I want to use one, when I want to use the other. Blocking should be safer. Blocking is safer but uh, it may have an impact on your performance. If you are sure that you're not using that data for a long time, non-blocking communication may be the best, and be aware of that blocks and all the uh, problems that come with it, between, uh, that come uh, with them, especially the fact that you may run without actually run. And uh, this is all for this part. So let's begin with people uh, still really to pay attention. Uh, I have a second part, which is really small. It will take only 10, 20 to 25 minutes, and it is more, mostly a rundown of many functions or routines. So they, they're not very expected. You could actually just read the slide and be fine, but uh, 
here I talk a little about them, and then the rest of the time where you can return doing exercise at the end of the session. So this part is about MPI collective communication. I told you at a certain point that we can have point-to-point -point communication from process A to process B and vice versa, and we can have a collective communication. All the processes on the same communicator, MPI convert in our case, can do uh, the communication at once. So communications are involving, in this case, a group of processes and are called the collectives or collective communication. They have uh, uh, these characteristics. They occur between process and communicator. It is important that every post process must call the collective communication because if there is just one process in the communicator that doesn't call it, then uh, the communication gets stuck because the communication is as waiting to have all the processes involved in the communicator to complete. They do not interfere with point to point calls, so they, they are independent to each other, let's say. They don't need tag because every uh, process is involved anyway. And uh, uh, you have to take care of the size of the receive buffers, but this is better explained in, uh, in the example slides. Uh, collectives are blocking, and until MPI free, they could only be blocking. And this is the, the main reason why you need to have all the communicators, all the processes in the communicator, uh, be aware of the communication. Starting from MPI free, non blocking communicators uh, were born. The standard has set them. Since this is a lesson about MPI 1, the very first standard, we are only talking about collective communicators in these examples. But if you're curious, remember that there is also the possibility to have non-blocking communicators. And uh, uh, these are typical use cases. Reading data from file and transferring to all other tasks, the broadcast. Synchronization among all the tasks. If you need to be sure that they have all reached a certain point in the execution, you can set up a barrier. You will see later how. And this also does the job. Uh, reduction operations. They have talked a lot about what is a reduction, what is reduced, what is all reduced. This can be done also with MPI. So performing an operation with elements that come from all the processes involved, the tasks involved, and uh, synchronization, not only of data, but also of tasks themselves. And from now on, an example after another. Very first is very easy. All the, all the processes that are stored inside a particular communicator uh, synchronize with this barrier. Let's say that everyone is at a different point in execution of their code. The barrier is set over here. When you get there, you stop, and uh, you the barrier opens only when every task involved is uh, inside the barrier is outside of the barrier, actually. It is risky. It is actually not recommended. It is useful when you do debugging, like you want to know if uh, before a certain part of the code, everything is fine, and after there are problems. So you set a barrier, you print that this is fine, and from there on, and check out the problem as well. It is not uh, recommended for production, because uh, you can see just by the drawing, it uh, gives you a lot of problems in terms of uh, uh, idling cycles. This uh, P3 doesn't do absolutely anything until all the others are synchronized with it. So this is not really a good thing. It is good for debugging, but uh, not very practical, and so it is not actually recommended. But uh, the main source of uh, collective communication, what we like most is uh, a collective message passage, message passing. So a quick example. Imagine that uh, task D, imagine that you have four, eight, a particular number of tasks. Task zero initializes an array of doubles of words, 2.0, 4.0. The goal is to send the data to all the other tasks. Imagine that we only know point-to-point -point communication, like we actually do so far. What can we how can we do this exercise with the knowledge we now have? We may do like this. If I am zero, then for a loop that touches all the other processes, basically, 
I send, I send an element A of size 2, type MPI float, I send it to I, so on each iteration of the loop, I send it to a different process, tag 0, and the communicator in that loop. If I'm not 0, I prepare to receive. I will receive in my A two elements that float from task 0. Tag 0, and the convert step. What happens here? That uh, i equals to 1, the send is uh, uh, sent data to processor 1. I, then uh, loops i equal to 2, I send to 2. Let's say that the communication are completed because the data can be used, etc. i equals to 3, I send again. Meanwhile, here, this is seen by any task except from 0, because it is inside this else. Any task waits for it to receive. If you imagine that we have uh, 24 tasks, the number 24, the number 23, because we go to 0 from 23, the number 23 will be the last to receive something because it has to wait until the final operation. This is highly inefficient. But we have a, com a collective communication for that. MPI broadcast. MPI broadcast requires a buffer, like uh, the point to point communication, a number of elements, a data type, and then a root. Root is the integer, which is the rank that is sending all the data to the others and your particular communication. Remember that collective communicators are inside the communicator. We are uh, seeing only MPI convert, so basically collective communicators for you are communicators that works for any task involved in your MPI job. But uh, imagine that you can, with other methods, define specific communicators and say only the first half is a communicator and collective works only for that, if you specify the correct communicator. In our examples, we only, only specify MPI convert. In any case, this is how it works. This data is broadcasted to all the others. The implementation, they, they use the GPUs today, but explain some idea of how implementation like this can work. It is architecture dependent and compiler dependent. You trust that MPI broadcast, whatever there is behind it, does exactly what you need. So uh, the broadcast can be done like this, and that. Uh, Part of code in the red squares that you have found before that does the same thing uh, with point to point are now reduced to a single instance. MPI bitcast, bitcast, I broadcast the array A of element 2, type MPI float, my root is 0, and uh, the communicator is MPI combo. For 0, A is uh, the array that I'm sending. For all the other, is the array where I'm receiving the same data. So now, since this will be uh, executed by every task, everyone will uh, write the, uh, the array. And if uh, everything went correctly, they will uh, all have received the same numbers. And so they will all print the same numbers together with the rank, which is unique. Typical error is to put the biggest in an if condition. Because in point to point, we need to use ifs. So maybe get used to it and make the mistake to use an if even here. This is a problem because we want the bcast to be read at the same time from all the processes involved to the communication. So you just put there, any process reads it. If I am zero, I know that I am the sender. If I am anything else, I know I was going to receive. And you, I don't need to put any kind of rank distinctions in it. So it is uh, quite needless to analyze uh, every uh, any other uh, collective communicator that I'm going to show. But uh, uh, if you uh, if you want to see a little, let's say that we take, we see one and two, and then I move faster to the others. Gather is a th uh, a collective communicator that uh, takes a chunk of data from any task and gathers everything in a single in a single uh, rank, which is the root that is over there. So I send, uh, started from a particular send buffer, a certain number of elements of a certain particular data type. I receive, in my receive buffer, that particular number of elements of that particular data type. I am redundant, but because uh, uh, MPI needs uh, uh, to be sure that you want to do exactly a certain thing with both the sender and the receiver. 
because for example i may want to create a derived data type that uh, uh, sends a particular uh, element a single element of a particular data type and receives in a contiguous array of element of another type so i may experiment a bit but uh, usually i just uh, send or receive the same thing just remember that uh, a typical mistake is to think that the receive count is the global array. The gather in the zero will need, should need the full size of the array as a receive count. This is not true. It still requires for the receive count, which is the number of elements of the single block that they're going to receive because they will store it contiguously in memory. So it, it doesn't need the global value of the array because it will calculate it. It just needs the single blocks so that everything can be stored when you use in memory after that. And then remember a root because someone has to get a root of it, not communicate. Similar to getter, there is scatter. At this point, you understand how it works. The scatter is the exact opposite. You get a root with a particular array and it divided this into chunks and sent the data to all the other tasks. And the syntax is almost the same. The recommendation is always also almost the same, only on the send count is not the receive count. And these are a number of things that you can do. You can, at this point, uh, increase the complexity. All gather is gather plus broadcast. I gather the data in a single, uh, in a single uh, task, which I don't even specify because I don't care, because at that point, a broadcast will also enter in action. And at the end, all the results gathered will be shared by all the other tasks involved. Of course, the, the biggest the, the collective communication, the higher the complexity. The most uh, complex of that of it is all to all. We have seen in these uh, days that there are better ways than using MPI to perform this kind of computation because the computation can be really heavy on your job. But just to let you know that everything started from here, as I was saying, this is like an history lesson. So at the beginning, there was MPI, I'll get MPI all to all, and they are still standard, so they can still be used, but to use it with uh, be, being careful with it because you are not uh, uh, guaranteed that uh, they will be uh, very performant. There are uh, math math mathematical libraries, uh, there are possibilities to deliver this, to offload this kind of uh, calculation to GPUs. And all this may be better, but MPI also has a standard for that. The all to all is a mix of everything. It scatters, it gathers, and the ending result is like a, a, a matrix transpose, let's say. Where the, the, the column one was at the beginning in different tasks, in different processes, and they are now gathered in the same process. But the other process has all that element that were in this column. The third problem, are, are third process, are all the elements that were in the column three and so on. So it is like transposing a metric with uh, this particular communication. There are other variations. For example, I don't want to gather or scatter equally sized amounts of data. I can set up strides and displacements. So I can say something like process zero gives me two integers. Process one gives me three integers. Process three gives me one integer. I set up an array of, of uh, of uh, sizes, and I can use getter v or scatter v, which do the same thing with uh, this particular uh, variation. But this is like just reading uh, calls uh, and then functions, so I am not really interested in showing that to you. I'm more interested to talk a little about reduction. Reduction collectives take the data, perform an operation, and return the result. We have two possibilities MPI reduce gives the result to only one uh, task, which is the root. MPI all reduce, broadcast the result to all the tasks. This is the famous all reduction discussed today. Uh, so you take the data, you have special operators that are uh, MPI operators. They can do sum, they can calculate the maximum, they can do standard operation stuff. I think there are also ways to define your own MPI operator, but I'm no expert of that. Uh, and at the end, the result is returned in the way that you decide. Here, I can see the syntax. A send buffer, a receive buffer, a count, which is a number of 
elements to be operated. The data type, like usual, the MPI operator that I was telling you about. The communicator, it has to be the same because this is still a collective communication. So every, every process has to see the call. And this is for standard reduce here and here also for or reduce. Here we have in C, in Fortran, it is the same thing with the ROD, like always. And everything is an integral. And if I remember correctly, there is an example here, but before the example is a, is a list of possible MPI operators. So we have calculator of maximum, minimum, sum, product, and the logical uh, operators of different kinds. These are standard operators. There may be more, and there may be also user-defined operators, but uh, you can start from this. So the example in Fortran for uh, Equality of example, variety of examples. Use MPI, integer for reference rank prox i, integer status of site MPI status site, as I was saying with the point to point. Do I need it? No. Okay. So it was just there because it was a different example before. Uh, two uh, arrays of uh, two elements of type real. A will be the input and the rest will be the result. MPI init, com size, the com rank to initialize prox and my rank. And then I initialize that by A. The first element is my rank and the second element is double my rank. So rank zero will have zero, zero. Rank one will have one, two. Rank two will have two, four, and so on. I call a reduce. I reduce L A array A. The result will be in the array rest, which is also two elements. Two elements of type MPI real. My operation will be MPI sum. Remember that for this case is insensitive, so you can write it like this, but in C, everything has to be uppercase. The root will be zero, the only one that we stole the result. MPI convert and the error at the end, because I'm four. At the end, my result, which is an array of two elements, will have the sum of the, all the first elements in its own first element and the sum of all the second elements in its own second element. So if I am zero, I am the only one who can write something with, uh, with sense here. So I put this, uh, this check. If I am zero, I'm the only one to write, and I write the result. At the end, I call the finalize. This is more or less how collective communication works. Notice once again that here, we don't have uh, ifs, and we don't have conditions, because everyone has to be, be collect. MPI for pi. MPI for pi. Um, let's see. Okay. This is an example of a, of a scatter. Root data is the the data that I'm gathering. It is also particular. One, two, three, and then a tuple of four, five. Uh, scatter takes the data. Everything else is implicit, and it needs only the root, which will be zero. And the result will be stored in the uh, in the array data that I'm defining here. And then I print. I print rank and see what happens in my, my data. Scatter is the one that takes a global array and divides the, the chunks. So every task will have something to write, which is their own local chunks. Uh, as for uh, uh, an reduction operation, note that I have to move away from the uh, object-oriented a way to describe in Python methods. I have to work with the buffer oriented because there are things that uh, uh, the object oriented implementation of a PI profile can, can handle, and one of them is relation operation. So here I have to think uh, in a buffer, uh, buffered way, let's say, more HPC. And so com reduce, uh, instead of having B equal to com reduce, uh, as I should expect. Uh, since now I will write in a more standard MPI way, I will send I will uh, yeah I will send A to perform the reduction and the result will be in B. And we store only my root and the operation will be MPI sum. MPI dot sum in case of Python. So the syntax is different and uh, the user of the case method is limited because reduction operators are undefined for most of the objects. And so you have to think in buffers for this kind of operation. This is, I think, the last slide, more or less, because as I was saying, and many people before me have said and have stressed this point a lot, collective communication are the main problem for performance. 
people started just uh, giving that as a given and telling you directly how to overcome this problem. So this is really true. And this is especially true for MPI since it is uh, the old way to perform parallel computing. So the first time this kind of problem has become important. You can see in this example, this code has been profiled. This is uh, an MPI all for all, the most uh, expensive communication of them all. That increases the execution time a lot with the variation of a message size. How my message size is the quantity of data that I am uh, scattering, gathering, and receiving all along. Uh, so this curve is definitely not linear. And also, I can see here uh, a profiling of a code, which is a molecular dynamics code called Gromax. Uh, they have less a lot on, uh, um, on uh, collective communication. And you can see that. Uh, this is serial code, so this is actual computation, and this is all MPI calls. So all the time is spent in communication, and the MPI broadcast, which is a collective communicator, is the one which is more, most needed. So be very aware to use it only if necessary. Avoid the barriers as much as you can, because they are uh, uh, affecting your, your uh, performance and do actually nothing in the meantime. Consider non-blocking collective, so consider going further this, this lecture and try studying for yourself MPI-free and non-blocking collectives. Define communicators, so you don't have to involve all MPI con world every time, but learn how to set up your specific communicators and use and work only of them. So the communication is collective, but at least it's reduced to the set of processes that you want. Work with your algorithms, try domain decomposition, try meshes, try everything that doesn't uh, require you to have co collective communication for cost. For example, domain decomposition usually needed to share data only with your neighbors. So standard point to point, you will do the job just fine. And uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we haven't discussed about uh, hybrid uh, parallel programming, mixing MPI with OpenMP. It is another topic with, for another day, but it is also a possibility. And that should be it. This is a review of 20 minutes of the talk.